just walking around in some kind of fog. I think we're all on a trance. People are talking in symbols. Everyone's sort of floating through this fog of symbols and unconscious feelings. Hello and welcome back to the Lucid Dreaming Podcast. This is episode 12 and there is a lot to talk about or at least a lot of exciting things to talk about. So let's get started. Um, there is some big, big news. There have been some big, big news and most of you probably have heard and maybe not. Uh, some of you I'm sure. But before I get to that, I, I should wrap up um, at least for now the follow-up on the supplement experiments that I've done and kind of put that aside for a while. I'm going to get back to it, but unfortunately my, my conclusion is for now that this is not an optimal way to, uh, to try to induce lucidity and, and here's why. So the, the first experiment I did was with a supplement called Alpha Brain that was heavily promoted for lucid dreaming and vivid dreams and so on. Um, and I, I won't go over the entire thing again. You can listen back to the supplement episode. I think, uh, I think it was episode 10 or episode nine and that didn't really produce any significant results, uh, in a span of a week or so. The second supplement I, I've tried, which I haven't mentioned, it was kind of clever, had a, a slightly different approach, although some of the same ingredients, um, and this one is one that's called the Dream Leaf, and it has some nice branding. It has some cool, you know, um, persona of sorts. And what's clever about it, and what's what's nice about it, uh, at least on the outside, is what they did was first of all, it's only particularly for lucid dreaming, unlike Alpha Brain, which is more for cognitive enhancement in general. Um, this one is formulated as two different pills. One you're supposed to take before you go to sleep, and the second one you take similar to uh, galantamine about four or five hours into your sleep. And the idea is that the first pill contains a few components uh, for you know better sleep or to prepare yourself uh, in your, your uh, uh, state of sleep. And the second one has a very similar effect to galantamine that is supposed to increase your awareness um, and, and hopefully uh, help you achieve lucidity. So I'll say a few things about that. So the, the first pill, um, I'm not sure of all the components. Some of them, they don't exactly reveal, or at least not the quantities. Um, but the first pill, and, and, and what's cool, what they did do is kind of cool is... They made one pill blue and one pill red, which is, of course, a reference for the to the Matrix. Um, but the first one includes a few things, including uh, mugwort, which is also known as uh, a lucid dreaming supplement. And for that reason, I've also tried that pill alone, but I've done that after the fact, and I'll, I'll get to that in a second. So you take that and the, and the second pill includes choline and huperzine A, which is again, very similar actually to alpha brain in terms of some of the components, maybe not some of the quantities. Um, for me, there were no obvious uh, effects in terms of achieving lucidity. It's obvious that it does have some effect. So for example, in, in this is, Part of the problem as well. The first time I've tried it, taking the first pill, slept great until I woke up and took the second pill, after which I could not fall back asleep. It's too, my brain was too agitated. Um, you know, I didn't know if it was just me thinking about it or, or the pill. The second time I've tried it, uh, and here is the sort of interesting weird effect is, and it's obvious that it does have some effect. 
I took the second pill five, five hours into my sleep and then proceeded, after the fact that I realized that, proceeded to dream about trying to fall back asleep. And I didn't realize that at the time I was thinking, I thought I was still in bed trying to fall asleep, thinking to myself, oh my God, this maybe this pill is too, wakes me up too much and I can't fall back asleep and I, I want to fall, fall back asleep, see if this pill works and tossing and turning. But when I woke up later, so this was a sort of restless sleep. When I woke up later, I realized that I wasn't really awake trying to fall back asleep. I was dreaming, trying, dreaming that I was trying to fall back asleep. How do I know? Because then I realized that I was actually on in a bed on some train trying to fall back asleep. Um, maybe that's my subconscious, you know, sort of sped up and 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 rushing, and um, and only after the fact I realized that I was it was sort of like a reverse false awakening. It's a false falling asleep of sorts, or not not thinking that I actually fell asleep, uh, but I did fall asleep. But my consciousness was obviously still occupied with, you know you know, trying to fall asleep, thinking about the, the pill and so on and the supplements. So that that didn't really work beyond that. And it really interrupted my sleep to such a degree that it was just, it was not worth it. And it was not really working. Even even the, um, um, the following time I've tried to reduce the quantity, I literally opened up the pill, removed half of the quantity and tried it again at the advice of the uh, creators of this pill. Um, which uh, were were very nice, but that really didn't even work for me. And after that, I've tried it once again, but only with the first pill because I, you know, again, I wanted to sort of explore mugwort on its own, uh, including whatever other ingredient it has, um, to see if that has any effect. And again, nothing, nothing in particular. The last, you know, issue with these kinds of thing, and this this applies both to Alpha Brain and Dream Leaf is that after a few times of use, and I did give it a break between each time, uh, except for one time where I tried it consecutively, is that I've realized that it has a weird effect uh, on my digestion and my, my stomach. Um, it was just the whole thing, something was off. It was not It was not my regular proper feeling of the body and the way I am on a daily basis. It was just offsetting something. And I think perhaps it's the Hooperzine A that, can cause at least in some quantities some some stomach issues so really between the disruption of sleep and the disruption of digestion and just the, the way I feel on a day-to-day uh, it was not great and it was not worth it and of course there was no you know big amazing effect that I say okay it's worth looking into now my conclusion at least for now is that either a it just doesn't quite work for me individually my metabolism, my biochemistry, uh, my psychology, who knows? And, or it's not that great in general or would not work for a lot of other people. Maybe it will work for some. And even if so, maybe it'll just be the placebo or maybe, you know, their uh, system is slightly different from mine and it could help. But again, to remind you, uh, those supplements, they can't like 100% cause lucid dreaming. They might be able, might, and I repeat, might be able to improve the conditions for lucidity. Um, so that's that's the general thing. And in fact, it somehow kind of ties into the subject for, for today's episode. But this is sort of the point of, you know, brain chemistry and body chemistry can only go so far in trying to help induce lucidity. It is your conscious awareness and perhaps your brain waves that affect it much more. And, and brain waves are also an indication and not necessarily just the cause of your conscious awareness or your awareness in general or your state of consciousness in general. And of course, the subject of today is the scientific study that came out a couple of weeks ago about this experiment that this group of scientists basically decided to try to stimulate the brain while 
in the subjects while they're sleeping uh, to try to induce lucidity. And they've done, in fact, they've done that very, very successfully. And their conclusion is that about um, 77% of their subjects out of the 24 people that were in the study, uh, people who have never had a lucid dream before, if I remember correctly, uh, have successfully achieved lucidity. Now, this is remarkable and it's amazing and it's exciting and the potential of it is phenomenal, but it's not quite news to me. And um, I've mentioned this before in the podcast, actually quite a while back when I was talking about theories on on how um, we might induce lucidity in the future. And we were talking about devices and EEGs and headbands and so on. I don't remember, maybe it was in the episode about brainwaves that I was uh, throwing that out as a theory. In fact, I had this theory that this might be possible um, basically the day I've learned about TDCS. And TDCS is basically transcranial direct current stimulation. And this is, it's not really a new field of science, but it is a field of science that is doing a sort of comeback now that there is the ability to do it more subtly, more accurately, and to research it properly. I mean, people have been sending electrical currents through people's brains since electrical currents were discovered. But now um, I remember reading the article in uh, Science-Based Medicine with by Stephen Avella, who I've mentioned before in the podcast. And I remember the article was about how this was one of those technologies in medical science that had looked like had potential for a while and you know it had some big claims on what it could do for all sorts of reason cognitive enhancement uh, improve learning um, maybe cure depression many 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 things and the article by him was about how this is finally actually looking to be a real legit new technology, new medical technology uh, that can that, that might be able to achieve a lot. And it was, this was, it was one of those uh, kind of very positive articles from a guy who's a professional skeptic. So I remember that piqued my curiosity and I started researching that just because I am fascinated with brain science and uh, uh, all these kinds of uh, emerging technologies. And I started reading more and more about it and right away connecting the dots and this was this was months ago where i said i wonder if you could take because i i read an article uh on a study that was done a long time ago like uh, many years ago where they basically took people um who you know who knew how to achieve uh, lucidity and how to how to practice lucid dreaming put them in uh under an fmri they wanted to scan their brains and, and see where uh, the brain activity happens or what kind of brain activity happens and in what areas of the brain when people achieve this known phenomena by now uh, called lucid dreaming. They wanted to see what's, what's happening in the brain. And fMRI is currently the, the device and the machine that can give us the most insight into it. I sort of thought about that study and about the particular areas of the brain that get activated um, when when you're achieving lucidity. And I thought, what if we take TDCS and apply it to the same areas of the brain that get activated during a lucid dream? What if we can uh, produce just a very low current uh, and stimulate those areas in the brain while you're sleeping, while you're in REM sleep, while you are dreaming, and see if that can actually trigger lucidity. And of course, there's TDCS is just sort of the main one that, that people are very excited about. And there's all sorts of variations. That's direct current stimulation. There's alternating current stimulation, the one that they actually used in the study uh, that I was also looking into. And basically what they did, and 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 then I I it was it was right at the time where the Aurora. Uh, headband was on Kickstarter, was launching on Kickstarter. And I was working until then on something very similar to that, a sort of EEG headband instead of the whole mask thing. And when they came out with that, I said, okay, they seem very, very far ahead and they seem like they've got it down. They they are working on their headband uh, and raising money for it. And they seemed on top of it. And I said, okay, 
I think I'm going to let them work on that and I'll move in, move to try my crazy out of the box, you know, idea. And at the time, I also haven't found any research on that, that anybody has tried it. I've seen people who have wondered about the same thing after I started digging around myself to try to figure out how to go about it. And uh, I, wanted, I wanted to tell you more about this project of mine, and I wanted to tell you more, a little more about the study. Uh, I won't go into too much of the details, but the reason I want to tell you is until now, I mean, I, I did speak about the concept, but I haven't spoken about my project on working on it because part of me, one, a part of me wanted to do the whole kind of Apple thing where suddenly they, you know, suddenly they come out with a product and it's kind of crazy and revolutionary and amazing. And there's something fun about that. I don't know. But a part of me also was, you know, I was working on a device and then, you know, somebody comes out with a Kickstarter and already uh, apparently has been working on it and ta-da, you know, um, kind of beats me to it in a sense. And part of me wanted to keep this one secret until I'm actually done contested and, and what I wanted to do is do the, the proof of concept. I wanted to test to see that it works and how well it works uh, before making any sort of announcements other than just saying, hey, I think this this might actually work. And what I want to do today and from now on is actually tell you what I'm working on and maybe even to some degree kind of let you in on the process and the progress. And part of the reason I I thought to do that is that I've realized that there's also benefits to having like a sort of open process about development. You can take a look at the people who are doing open source projects, even open source hardware, like the OpenBCI, which is another sort of EEG device uh, for the masses that had also a Kickstarter campaign. They're supposed to ship uh, their devices in July. I'm hoping to get mine because uh, I've been working with really sort of more of the DIY stuff, uh, the Open EEG, and uh, and a few other versions of uh, EEG devices. So I think opening this up and talking about the process could allow other people who are interested in the same thing to sort of pitch in, to give feedback, and just you know, if, you know, if it interests me, I hope that it interests you, and if it's fascinating for you to sort of get clued in on the process and how it goes, or maybe just about the progress of it. I'm sure it's going to be interesting to some people. So that's why I want to talk about it a little more. Let me tell you a little more about the research and let me tell you a little more about where I'm at with it and then sort of the plan for the future. I hope that, I hope it makes sense. So the, the study that they did, um, they took 24 people and they wanted to and, and let me clarify a few things about electrical stimulation to the brain. I mean, that sounds very excessive, but this is a really low current stimulation. Uh, it's so low, in fact, that you can't even feel it. In some versions of it, you can feel it. In TDCS, people apply, at least the medical community applies no more than, like, I think, two milliamps. Um, if you go beyond that, I think you can sort of feel a tingling but in what they did as well in the uh, low current stimulation, TACS, in, in this study, it's very low and it's undis almost undistinguishable. You can't really, you can't really feel it. Uh, it's not enough to wake you up at the very least. So they applied a low, cur um, low current in, in a range of spectrum, I think somewhere between 100 or 200 uh, hertz. And what they're what they're trying to do in, in part, or what they ended up basically doing is when they applied to some of these people during their REM state, 25 and 40 hertz, 40 hertz, uh, and this is all in the range of gamma. Gamma is about, again, gamma is, a, is between 25 and up towards even the 80 or 100 hertz is the brain waves that, that get produced in a lucid dream. The interesting thing, and again, if you want to, if you missed it, you can go back to the episodes I did, the episode I did about brain waves. This is very interesting. Uh, gamma waves are not usually that common on a day-to-day -day basis. They are, they, they, they do appear often enough, but they get 
more produced, you see them a lot in meditation, in some types of meditation. And they are very connected to feelings of euphoria, to um, when people exhibit uh, empathy, compassion, some various states of uh, focus, concentration, or awareness, the brain produces gamma waves. And of course, in lucid dreaming as well, the brain produces gamma waves in the frontal cortex. When the when these scientists applied 25 and 40 hertz in particular, which are in the in the range uh, of gamma waves, this basically it's sort of like in this particular case, let's say sort of resonance where it gets the brain to produce these waves, and the one they found most optimal is 40 hertz. Which is, again, if you if you go back to this, the other study I mentioned that they've done a while back to see what the brain produces under an fMRI, most of them have produced 40 hertz, which is part of the reason why they tried these these sort of levels. 25 is where uh, gamma brain waves starts approximately, and 40 is where it usually sits around, or the average uh, when producing um, conscious awareness within a dream, so in, in the lucid dream. This is phenomenal. This is very interesting because we've been, everybody's been looking forever for a way to aid for people to, to achieve lucidity. Um, anywhere from basic techniques to writing a dream journal to, um, you know, all these, the whole thing about supplements. Why do people are so fascinated with supplements? It's not just because they're looking for so this method or this like magic pill or something like that but lucidity for some people for some people are they're natural and it's very easy but for some people it's it's very difficult and you know they can work on it for a very long time or maybe they don't even have the conditions the right conditions like enough sleep because they work a lot of hours or proper sleep because they have some condition that they don't sleep very well or their memory is just shot um or or any other thing so this really has the potential to make it very, very accessible. Now, let me also point out that I don't think necessarily that this might be able to give you anything more than just achieving lucidity, which is sort of the phase one of being lucid. Uh, now, that's a lot. That's actually plenty. What I don't think it will be able to give you, as far as we can tell, at least for now, this is very preliminary, is things of level of awareness, um, vividness, control, even though in the study they did try to test for that. Like they asked people after they woke them up from the dream, what was the level of vividness? How much control did you have over the dream? How much awareness, you know, how much, how, how much of a recognition of the fact that you were dreaming did you have? And they were trying to rate that. And it does seem like it had some some effect on these different aspects, but not not completely, at least not from the analysis of, from what I can tell from the study. It's not completely clear. In order to do a lot of the things that you can do in lucid dreaming, you would still need to practice. But if you do have something that can help you trigger lucidity pretty reliably, then you'll have the chance to practice it. So this is not a complete solution for everything, but it is to get you through the door. And it could could help you get through the door into a lucid dream. And that's the exciting potential about this. Where I'm I'm at at the project and what I'm working on exactly. So for, for a very long time, I've been just playing around with the whole concept of uh, EEG things. Now, the thing with EEG is not just to read your brainwave, but to be able to reliably recognize when you are uh, in theta brainwaves and in a REM state in particular, to indicate that you're dreaming. It needs to be built in such a way that you can sleep with it. Okay, so not just whatever's wrapped around your head, that it's not connected to wires into a computer or to a bulky device or something. That has been, you know, somewhat challenging. But because when I, you know, sort of switched to working on this idea, because the whole concept of EEG and even, you know, a do-it-yourself kind of EEGs that, that have been out there, that part of, for the most part, have been solved. Like this is, this is no longer new. There's open source software for it. There's people building applications for these. 
There's, again, I mentioned uh, the OpenBCI project. There's the OpenEG project. People are building sort of dream recognition systems with just an accelerometer that can check if you're you know, moving or maybe just your eye movement. There are other devices. Uh, I think the Aurora iWinks guys are building it off of the NeuroSky chipset, if I remember correctly. And the Muse, the Interaxon Muse has shipping delays, but should arrive soon as well. Uh, and supposedly you should be able to sleep with it from what the way it looks like. I'm not quite sure, but maybe it works. Maybe for people who sleep on their back, um, it works well enough. And that's, and that's the thing. This is sort of, you know, been solved. So what I did was is decide to move my efforts from that part of it to the whole TDCS, TACS uh, component. So there are two main components to this. There's the EG or any way to recognize that you're dreaming that will give a signal to the secondary part of the device that will basically give you an electrical, very low electrical current for a very short period of time to a specific location in, in a very specific way. Now, this has a slew of issues uh, that need to be addressed. And the reason this is not quite yet on the market or you know has been fully tested is the way I'm working on it, at least, it has to do a few things. One, it has to be safe. First and foremost, this is still working with um, electricity, it's still working on running a current through your brain, and it's trying to do it while you're sleeping. So one, if you're going to end up using this device, you're going to do it on your own. Nobody is going to stand next to you while you're sleeping and monitor to make sure this thing is running properly. Uh, and even when I'm, when I want to test it on myself, if I actually want to test it while going to sleep, I can't be also awake to monitor the thing. So you sort of have to put a lot of fail safes in it. Now, if you're wondering, well, you said it's, you know, low current, what's the problem? Well, even low current, you can't keep it running for very, very long. One of the few, if not only sort of consumer grade consumer TDCS device is called the Focus. And it's four electrodes uh, sitting on your forehead. And the purpose of this device is to run a very low, I think one to two milliamps current uh, to increase focus. That's that's the idea of the, the device. Even that one, you you cannot run or should not run for more than 20 minutes at a time because you'll start to feel some side effects. Now, of course, these things are still safe, but there's limits to all these things. Too much of a good thing is no longer a good thing, even if it's a good thing. So you have to keep that in mind. Definitely, definitely, you can't have this thing run for hours while you're sleeping. What if it turns itself on when you're dreaming, the first dream cycle, and for some reason doesn't turn off? You can't have that happen. If you're not going to wake up to make it stop and to make sure it's running well, it has to work well and it has to be safe. Okay, so that's really the the number one priority in, in me working on this. Um, all right, let's say I figured out all the fail safes, all the mechanisms and safety mechanisms that are going to put, be put into this. The other component is having the first part of the device, the EEG or whatever component that is, recognize the fact that you're dreaming and then send a signal to activate the device, the, the TACS device, the, the electrical current to run at that particular time and for a limited time. Now here's the other couple components to that that I am working on and have to pay attention to. The first part of it is that the device has to be placed properly on your head and it has to be um, in the same place it has since, since it's placed on particular areas uh, and supposed to activate particular areas of the brain then it's supposed to be placed on your head in a certain way and it needs not to move even if you're moving when you're sleeping if you're tossing if you're turning if you're moving from side to side it really has to be reliably located in the same places. So we have to build it in such a way that it doesn't move so much. 
okay? Or that if in some way it does move, maybe it knows not to activate, maybe, you know, I can't imagine that it can adjust, but it's really that sort of thing that, that we have to think about. So it does need to activate in the right place on your head. So that's the first thing. The second thing, uh, and this is sort of hopefully a sort of upgrade that will come at some point, is a feedback loop between the EEG and the electrical current device is that once the electrical current is running, the EEG is probably going to be affected by that and needs to adjust its algorithm to really recognize what's going on. And once the current has stopped, the EEG is trying to recognize if you've achieved lucidity, if there are uh, gamma brain waves, if there are indications of conscious awareness while REM is still going on. And if it doesn't, maybe it can send a signal to run another current for 30 more seconds. So that's just kind of the general idea, sort of feedback loop fail safe for the activity of lucidity and thus increasing the chances of this actually working. If it can't or if it doesn't work two times in a row in actually helping you achieve a different state of consciousness and awareness in a dream to tell it to stop. Why? Because maybe the device moved on your head, it's not placed in the right place, maybe it's off your head because you tossed around, all these sorts of things. So there, there's still, the concept is simple in concept, but there is still a lot that has to go into it, especially if this is going to be a consumer device. I know people are clamoring for, you know, sell me something, give, give us something that will help us uh, achieve lucidity. And beyond that, of course, it needs to be comfortable so you can actually sleep on it with it. It maybe needs to kind of look okay. If it's very clunky and there's wires and there's things and it's, you know, if it looks silly, you know, it's uh, maybe it will work, but it will d d detract a little bit from it. So there's a lot of aspects to it. And the thing I'm working on right now is all the safety mechanisms. So that's where I'm at at the project. The second stage, of course, after that, um, will be testing, uh, even at the most crudest level um, and setup of the prototype. The the next phase after the safety mechanisms and working that and seeing that it's working while I'm awake and sitting and it's on my head, uh, then of course will be real testing. And I'll keep you posted on that. I'll keep you posted on progress as much as I can. If you have knowledge in this area, in neuroscience and electrical engineering, uh, get in touch with me. There is the possibility of me uh, even collaborating with other people who are working on other devices, um, which if will happen, I'll keep you posted on that as well. So that could be interesting. And I'm very excited. I mean, I've been excited about this since I've started working on it. <laughs> I remember on that Sunday when the, when the first article popped on my feed, uh, because I have alert about loose dreaming on the web and I saw it and I had that that moment I had that like I freaking knew it because it's been a theory of, of mine for quite a while and just seeing you know uh, in a scientific um, settings with people or you know medical grade devices not only have done this but have achieved the proof of concept that I've been working towards and not only that but have basically laid the map for specifics for how they did it what they did the number of hertz and the type of current the type of devices and so on uh, to help speed up the whole process i believe i would have reached the same thing sooner or later but this has saved everybody a tremendous amount of time so this is this is fascinating and the you know the applications for these are are tremendous the um, ramification for them in terms of medical actual medical devices they are thinking about you know, of course, um, helping ex explore consciousness more, maybe helping even people with post-traumatic stress disorder deal with nightmares, and so on and so forth, which I'll get to uh, nightmares and, and other applications of lucid dreaming in general, uh, which I wanted to talk about in perhaps the next episode. But I just wanted to share uh, with you what I'm sort of doing in that regard and a little more, a little more about the, the subject of this kind of thing. This is very exciting. In fact, I was... The, the first time I planned on um, mentioning this this device was 
um, when I finish an article that I've been working on for a few weeks, it's going to be very, very interesting. That includes, part of it is about uh, gadgets and devices, but it's um, one of my favorite articles so far that I've I've been working on. So I'm excited to share that, and I, I think I'll do a sort of article podcast episode duo uh, about that subject that I'm writing I'm writing on. So hopefully that was interesting, fascinating, captivating, and the likes. And um, I hope you've enjoyed that this episode. I know I'm excited, and uh, I'll keep you posted on all of my developments. If you have questions, feedback, concerns, comments, and so on, you can always reach me um, by email, contact at lucidsage.com, or on Twitter at the lucidsage.